Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we have a case uh, that's from Florida, because, you know, why not at this point, so settle in. And for this story, the year it is 2004. The place, just around Miami, and the who, be not the band, be the family, that's John, Susan, and their two adopted children. And for them, life was good, they had success, they had love, they were living in Florida. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, right? And you know what that means? Each day is better than the next. Wait, certainly is in this one, because it is a story of hitmen, of alibis, of, of, of grudges long held, deservedly so, maybe we will see, we will get into it, and you know what that means. Like when I say we will get into it, I clearly mean, let's give it a go! Just outside of beautiful Miami lies the city of Coral Gables. It's in the Miami-Dade County area, and it's just a few miles south of downtown Chester Brown. It's home to approximately 50,000 people, I'm told. I did not count them. In Coral Gables, you'll find the University of Miami, some beautiful Mediterranean-style architecture, one hell of a murder mystery that we will, you know, put on our little G-string swimsuits and dive into, but also you'll find lots, and I mean L-O-T-S, my friends, of rich folk. Yeah, you heard me right. Dollar dollar bills, folks, and riddle me this. If you were so inclined to, you know, be in some form of legal trouble or issues, well, who would you call? Who are you gonna call? You're gonna call the Sutton Law Group, headed by one John Sutton. They were operating out of South Miami, and had been established in 1985. A small firm, boutique is the word, small but selective. They wouldn't take on, you know, any El Chancer who was walking through the door, they weren't ambulance chasers, they would take on cases that, you know, were high profile, sometimes international cases. And the firm was headed up by John Sutton, licensed to practice since 1972. On the 22nd of August 2004, John and his wife Susan were celebrating in their home in Coral Gables. A beautiful home with a boat out back even. Whoa, they got a friggin' boat! And Susan, it was her birthday. She had just turned 57 years of age. Spirits were high, and an added bonus was that the Sutton Law Group had just won three big cases. Susan herself, she worked as an office manager for the firm. Good times? all around. John and Susan had been married since the 70s, after meeting during a blind date, getting hitched just one year later. Susan was head nurse of a surgical intensive care unit before giving up her career when her and John adopted their first child, Christopher. They were over the moon about it. You know, John and Susan, they desperately wanted to have children, but for one reason or another, they simply couldn't, so when they finally, you know, were able to adopt Christopher at two days old, pure joy. And then, seven years later, they adopted another child, Melissa, and they were a very happy family. They were having an intimate little party at the house to celebrate Susan's birthday and also the success of the law firm. There was John, Susan, Christopher, Chris's girlfriend Juliet, and John's law partner and close family friend. Teddy Montoto. John and Susan's daughter, Melissa, was away in college upstate at the time, ready to start the semester so she couldn't make it. Though she did call to wish her mother a happy, you know, big ol' happy HB. The party ended early enough. Chris and Juliet, they went out to catch a flick at the local cinema. Teddy, he went home, he went to separate ways. John sat down on the couch, started watching some telly. While Susan, she was in the bedroom on the phone, you know, various people calling to wish her a happy birthday. A quiet end to a nice night. Though the quiet wouldn't last for long. Hours later, John called 911. He was barely conscious. Call Gables 911. I need to leave my house. I'm just been assaulted. What happened, sir? Somebody came in and shot me. They shot you? Yes. Who did it? I don't know. I can't see. I need police and I need an ambulance. Okay, where did he shoot you? My head. Are you bleeding? Do you see any blood? I'm bleeding all over, yes. Okay. I can't see. Who else is in the house with you? My wife is. And where is she? 
I don't know. In the middle of the night, someone had came into their house and shot him twice in the head. How he survived is simply a miracle. He managed to stumble outside into the arms of, you know, the paramedics who had raced to the scene. John was then taken away, and it was, it was in fact SWAT who entered the house because the paramedics couldn't go in um, because due to, you know, the 911 call, they could, they, essentially they didn't know if the shooter who had done this was still inside the house. So the, a SWAT team had to go in, you know, into that very quiet house, clearing it room by room and eventually getting to a bedroom. Susan, she often slept in a spare room. John, he was a snorer and this time she was in the spare room. They almost didn't see her. They walked in and they could just see a lump under under the blanket. Susan was there. She had, she was found with the blanket, like she was trying to hide under the blanket from whoever came in, but it didn't work. Susan, she had been, she'd been shot six times. She was dead. And beside her lay, lay her phone. She had, she'd been on the phone, you know, talking to somebody about her birthday when someone came in. The first thought was like a, you know, attempt, an attempted murder-suicide, right? As you would in a lot of these cases, you know, John took out a gun, he shot his wife, and then he tried to kill himself. But John, he had been shot twice in the head, but he had been shot a number of times in the hands, as in defensive wounds, trying to stop the bullets. So, you know, that him doing it was quickly... No, someone had come in, and a broken latch was found in the rear of the home. Though what was interesting is that the killer would have had to walk through pretty much the entire house to get to John and Susan, yet nothing was stolen, nothing was ransacked. There was like diamond, you know, jewelry just laying out there in the open, and it still lay there when the police were checking it out. So, as we see in these cases, they, John and Susan, the wealthy, successful, generous couple living in a beautiful and safe neighborhood, had had a target on their back. And now we got a real whodunit and a why do do that with John laying in intensive care after taking two to the head. The first port of call was, naturally, who John Sutton ran into on a daily basis. Lawyers can make enemies, suing, settling, and there's usually a loser at the end of the day. One who may end up owing a lot of money or even be in prison. And John was a tenacious lawyer. And so people who ended up on the sharp end of his stick may have wanted to know where he lived and taken revenge on him. One woman had just previously threatened to shoot up his law office after uh, losing to him. Well, now it seemed like maybe someone wasn't just him out. Maybe they weren't going to just threaten, they were going to do. Now, Susan was gone, and John, he was in intensive care, and he couldn't, he couldn't speak. In fact, uh, Chris, the son, obviously, who was rushed to his dad's side, he wanted his dad, John, listed as John Doe uh, on the hospital records in case the hitman fucking Terminator style tried to come into the hospital and finish him off. So they couldn't tell the police much about what had happened. But remember, Susan had been on the phone at the time of the attack. Somebody had been on the, on the other end of the line and heard shots, perhaps, ring out. It turned out that she had been on the phone with Teddy Montoto, the family friend. Even after the shooting, Teddy had raced to the house armed with a pistol, obviously hearing and then fearing the worst. This was something the police instantly took an interest in. He was questioned, his hands tested for gunshot residue, his own gun tested, and then he was let go. But one thing they did learn about Teddy, um, kind of like a by the by, uh, Teddy had been having an affair with Susan, so hmm, that's not good. The police though were really just waiting for John to, to wake up. He had been put into a medically induced coma as they had surgery after surgery on him, shot twice in the head. He's lucky he could walk at all, you know what I mean? Um, but they were just waiting for him to wake up, so hopefully he could say something. He was the only witness to what happened. Witness what happened would sadly be the last thing John ever saw. When he awoke, John was informed by doctors that not only was his wife gone, but that he was blind in both, both his eyes. Uh, the bullet had entered his right eye, had destroyed his right eye, and then continued and cut the nerve, the optic nerve, in his left eye. And all John could say was he had seen the guy. He was dressed all in black with a vi visor over his face. So, not much. 
John would move in with his son Chris and Juliet, and later they would all move to the main family home, no longer a crime scene. And the investigation, which was stretching two months long, continued. Eventually, after combing through mounds of evidence, I'm talking, you know, interviews, phone records, the whole kit and caboodle, they did come across one little thing that piqued their interest. On the 22nd of August, the day of, Chris Sutton had made about a dozen calls to a guy named Garrett Cop. Now, that's a lot of phone calls, and it just seems to be, you know, when you're talking about the day somebody broke into your parents' house and killed them, and you were talking to somebody, somebody quite a lot, why? Chris was even speaking to Garrett an hour after the shooting when Chris was coming out of the cinema. So who was Garrett? Well, he was a frequent caller to the house. He was a friend of Chris, so okay, nothing too weird there. He had helped out around the place, and uh, after the shooting, Chris had even asked Garrett, would you go into the house and rip up the bloody carpets where, you know, they my, both my parents had been shot and one of them killed? Garrett did. But Garrett had also been in some trouble, namely one day after the shooting, on the 23rd of August. He'd gotten into a physical altercation at some apartments and he'd pulled out a gun. He was charged with aggravated assault. And when he was taken in booked and the gun taken off him by the police, the investigators in the Sutton homicide and blinding would learn that that gun was the very same type as the one used to kill Susan and blind John. After the arrest, the police kept the gun, so they could test it, and they learned it was the exact same gun. So now they had their suspect and their murder weapon. But caught A on scale, what is the story here? What, what did Chris know? Did he know? Garrett had called him right after. Well, Chris had been a troublemaker growing up, plenty of vandalism. He was sent off to boarding schools, but was kicked out of each one. He had some run-ins with drugs, arrests, and eventually, with seemingly no other options for him, John and Susan took an extreme course of action when he was 17 years old. They ended up sending Chris across the Pacific to Samoa, to a place called Paradise Cove. Is roll call going to class? They're going to class? Yeah. And that's a roll call. That big fella is a school. Oh man, that's beautiful. Now, Paradise Cove is one of those youth camps troubled youths are sent off to. Um, think of those things where, you know, these guys come into your house and then they drag your kid kicking and screaming out of their bed in the middle of the night, send them off to Utah to be processed and then to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Who are you? Who the f*** out of my room? It was practically a prison. You slept on a mat in a crowded room. It was all male. There were even arrests of some of the people who ran these sort of camps. Essentially, you know, there was a lot of abuse happening. Uh, duct tape in their mouths, hog tying kids, and much worse, physical and sexual abuse also occurred. The US State Department would investigate and basically say, don't send your kids here. It's, it's, a, it, it's a prison. It may as well just be a prison. The, you know, if you, any acting out, they will come down on you like a ton of bricks. You know fucking about with these places and how they treat kids. But I should probably just mention this also. One of the deciding factors for John and Susan was that um, shortly before, Susan was cleaning uh, young Chris's room and she found a handwritten note detailing about how Chris wanted to kill uh, his parents, John and Susan, to get their inher the inheritance. So, I mean, you know, get him the fuck out. Christopher was sent at 17 years of age. He was kidnapped in the middle of the night by strangers, taken out of his bed, and sent away in a plane halfway across the world. And he was there for almost two years. I put it right. I mean, I've been, I've been struggling to get me out of your parents. Uh, I've been here for you now. Uh, I feel like I'm in the same spot as some of you guys. I don't know how I feel like you guys can react when I get with you. I'm so busy feeling with you, but I don't even know if I'm not. I don't even know if I want you guys to know. But when the family went to visit him after a year, <laughs> brand new shampoo. Chris was a new man. He was tanned. He was buff. He was like a, he was a proper gentleman now, you know? Um, 
they they turn them into a, a, a good a good person. Uh, you don't want to know how. But he seemed happy out. Though when Chris turned 18 years of age, legally an adult, Chris thought, um, hey, I'm out of here. I'm an adult. Uh, no. Not quite so. It turned out that John had signed a court order forcing Chris to stay until he completed the course. Which would be, you know, another, practically another year. And as you can imagine, Chris was not best pleased about hearing, hearing about this. Chris was 19 years old when he came home. And now a blind John Sutton was living with Chris, whose best friend may have blinded him and killed his wife. And Chris's good behavior from the camp hadn't lasted. Him and Garrett sold drugs and did all sorts. It's pretty insidious. Garrett was eventually brought in, and he caved. He told them Chris had ordered him to do it, or else Chris said he would come after him. Now, the cops didn't exactly believe that Chris would come after Garrett if he didn't do this. But being the mastermind, sure, why not? Did he formulate this plan, or was it a combined effort between two of you? He did. What plan did he tell you? What did he want you to do? Go in the back door, walk in, and shoot. Garrett Cop copped to everything that he and Chris had met in Juvie. That Chris was to pay him $100,000 for the job. Though, the wait, like, he, on one side he said he was forced to do it, and then he said he was paid to do it. Which was it, Garrett? Come on now. He said Chris and him spoke about what he was to wear, that Chris had bought him the black outfit, told him that the back entrance to the house was the easiest way to get in. Chris even traded to get the gun for him. Garrett was a high school dropout at 20 years old. He had no education, no steady work, a criminal record, and a baby. That's like, um, you know, kind of starting out on, on high difficulty mode. He was a deadbeat drug dealer like Chris, and it was a get-rich-quick scheme for them both. Garrett didn't give a shit about Chris's parents, he was just in it for the money. Now, there actually was a precedent, though, for Garrett turning on Chris, as he did in the interrogation, and telling the police everything instead of keeping his mouth shut. See, a few years previous, Chris had given Garrett drugs to sell, and Chris had even set him up with the client to sell, too. But that person turned out to be an womp womp undercover cop. Not only that, the drugs Chris had given him to sell were fake drugs. So Garrett didn't do any time, because after all he was selling fake drugs, but you can see how that would plant a seed in Garrett's head. Now Chris would say he, he never intentionally set him up, but who knows what Garrett believed. And that would be a grudge he always held against him. Garrett Cop was arrested and charged with first degree murder. On Chris, though, they had nothing. That was until they spoke with Juliet, who told them that, yeah, Chris was planning something like this for some time. Juliet told the police that revenge and greed were on his mind 24-7. He hated his parents viciously and constantly spoke of how they owed him and how he would get them back. And John was then told that the person he was living with that the person who was taking care of him, his son, his own son he had raised since he was two, year, two days old, was a killer. Chris was arrested and he too was charged with first degree murder. Possibly, it would be a death penalty case. Garrett would plead guilty and agree to testify against Chris Sutton in exchange for a 30 year sentence. In July 2010, Chris and Chris alone stood trial for the murder of Susan Sutton and the attempted murder of John Sutton his own parents. Ladies and gentlemen, shrouded in black, the gunman left his car and headed out into the stillness of a Sunday night. Down the tree-lined streets of Coral Gables, in the shadow of the country club where he had parked his car, and set out on foot towards his targets a few blocks away. Across the waterway, left on Orduna Drive, two houses down, on the right, 4725. A 9mm Glock semi-automatic pistol stuck in his waistband. He was a man on a mission, a mission to murder John and Susan Sutton. 
Well, once the defendant was taken into custody, he was brought to the homicide office at the headquarters building, and he was given his Miranda rights. He was told he had a right to remain silent. He was told that anything he said could and would be used against him in a court of law. He was told that he had a right to have an attorney present and that he could not afford an attorney. One at that time or at any time, one would be provided to him free of charge. The lead detective, Larry Bellew, told the defendant some of the evidence they had against him, that Garrett Kopp had given a statement incriminating him, and that his girlfriend, Julia Driscoll, had also given a statement to the police. The defendant's reply, he burst out sobbing, put his head on the table and said, I'm fucked. It was a circumstantial case. Only words could be used against him, really, that he was involved. Mr. Cobb, did you shoot to kill Susan Sutton? Yes. And did you succeed in killing Susan Sutton? Yes. With what type of a weapon? Handgun. Did you shoot to kill John Sutton? Yes. Did you succeed in killing John Sutton? No. And who was the person with whom you were in a plan to shoot John and Susan Sutton? Chris. When you say Chris, do you have a full name? Chris Sutton. Did the defendant propose to you that you two should kill John and Susan Sutton as a way to get money? Yes. The motive was inheritance. They had a lot of money, and that's not even counting the large house, the cars, and the boat. And then, to cap it off, revenge was also the motive. Revenge for the years he claimed they had stolen from him while he was living on a rock in the Pacific Ocean. Now, there came a time when you were at the program when you figured that um, you would leave at 18, correct? Yeah. And you wanted your independence, correct? Sure. Okay. And then you found out that your parents had um, made sure that you would be forced to stay at the program after 18, correct? Yeah. Okay. And they got a court order to keep you in the program, correct? They, yeah, they detained some kind of court order. And you were furious at them, weren't you, Mr. Sutton? Yeah. And didn't you tell Ms. Driscoll that um, your parents, you should not have been in the program as long as you were, correct? Absolutely. And didn't you tell her um, that you had been kidnapped, correct? Yeah. And you told her that you didn't deserve what happened to you, correct? Correct. And you told her that you were forced to do hard physical labor, correct? Correct. And that you were beaten? Correct. And that you were hogtied? Yes. And that you were fed with other people's feet, correct? At one instance, yes. And that the kids were abused at the program, weren't they, Mr. Sutton? Yeah. And that you were angry with your parents for sending you there, weren't you, Mr. Sutton? Yeah. And that you were still angry with your parents? No, I was still angry with the program. Isn't it true, Mr. Sutton, that you told Julia Driscoll that your parents should pay for what they did to you? In that conversation, yes. But Chris was pleading not guilty, saying he never would have done what happened. State of Florida versus Christopher Sutton. We have the jury in Miami-Dade, Florida, this 21st day of July, 2010. Find the defendant, Christopher Patrick Sutton. As to count one, guilty of first degree murder is charged in the indictment. As to count two, guilty of attempted first degree murder. Chris Sutton was found guilty of first degree murder and attempted murder, and he was sentenced to three life terms in prison, where he remains to this day leaving his destroyed family in his wake. His once family. The table's right, the table's right there. Yes. Yes, Mr. Sutton. <clears throat> May it please the court. Unfortunately, justice has been done. Properly and fortunately, justice has been done. Regardless of the result, this is a bad case. The state didn't talk about the wheel calling, coming off my CLK AMG Mercedes all by itself with only one lug nut. The state didn't talk about my safe being stolen from my office with my mementos from my family 
when the burglar alarm was turned off on March 5 or so of 2005. And that is Chris, someone who, you know, had this revenge in them their entire lives and could just never let it go. I mean, I always wonder how you can harbor hate for that long and then look after these people, live with them, do all sorts for them. I mean, Susan and John, whether it was a good thing or not that they sent Chris away, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there. I suppose I can't really judge him. And maybe I can't judge Chris either. Well, actually, no, fuck that. I actually can't judge him because he did kill his mother and then blind his father. So no matter how much hate you have, pretty extreme. So you might want to buckle up there, you know, steady on, steady on, pal, come on. But John, on the other hand, by the way, the man who testified against his own son, you know, in court, who was blinded, whose wife was murdered, and he also found out that his wife, found out his wife was cheating on him too, which, oof. Well, he, um, like I said, he was tenacious. He didn't let his blindness stop him later. He loved swimming and skiing, and he still does them today. He later remarried. And he still works at the Sutton Law Firm in Miami. And I gotta say, this headline, it, it actually made me laugh. When asked if there was any chance of reconciliation between him, John, and his son, Chris, maybe go visiting him while he's in prison for the rest of his life, well, John had some choice words. Basically, ain't happening. Well said. No mucking about here. And like in all my stories, life moves on, for better or for worse, that train don't stop. Shanae, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with me, watching this whole video. Uh, I hope you found it uh, as interesting as I did, because it's pretty wacky. Is that the best word to use? I don't know. But, um, hey, you know, please check out Twitter. That chapter, that underscore chapter on Twitter, that underscore chapter on Instagram, and you can check out Patreon, where there's exclusive videos, early access videos, and a couple other bits and bobs. But, you know, that kind of wraps it up. So, yeah. Thanks for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. All the things. And I will see you, as always, real soon in the next one. But until then, please look after each other, look after yourselves, because I love you. Bye, Gabe.